Uh, thanks, Jody, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I want this to be like a conversation. So if you have any questions at any point in time, like let me know. I also created a document that I'll be like sharing my screen. Um, and I can share that after the after the um, after this um, event uh, for you guys to just be listening, be engaged, and like the notes are there. Um, but yeah, basically I graduated uh, MSB in 2017 with a degree in finance. Um, I always thought that I wanted to be a banker. So I did my junior internship. I did it in, here in New York, uh, JP Morgan. Um, like two weeks into the, into the internship, I told the managing director I didn't want an offer. So that was a bit, uh, that was a bit risky because I think you should always leverage all the tools you have in hand. Uh, but there were not um, there were not a lot of spots available, so I didn't want to take that from other people. Um, but the main idea there is that I understood that banking was not for me, like very quickly, and that was like my first realization. And my big, big first realization in life is everything that I thought uh, in two weeks crumbled. So after that, um, I struggled coming up with an answer to what I wanted to do post-graduation. Um, the one thing I did know about is I really wanted to understand how a company operated and was managed. Uh, so for that reason, I decided to begin my career with a rotational program. Um, that's when I started uh, and I joined ASR Group. So ASR Group is the largest vertically integrated uh, sugar refiner in the world. They have operations worldwide. Uh, they have their parent company to Domino Sugar. Pretty sure you've seen that in the shelves. Um, Florida Crystal, CNH, that's in the US. They also have in Canada, Red Path. They have Sidul in Portugal, Tate and Lyle in the UK and several others. And my main task was to rotate throughout the the company in three years and understand the supply chain operations, but also the different um, departments that are not from the day-to-day -day operations. So for example, like the M&A team, like how do we acquire, how do companies acquire other companies? What do you look for, right? Um, but then my first year, I packed up my bags and I traveled throughout the world. I started up uh, in Belize, cutting cane with the farmers, literally just waking up every day, living in a farm for like a month. Um, and then after understanding how you, how, act, like, how you grow cane, right, in, in the fields, how you actually harvest it, then I moved to Belize, uh, to Mexico to learn the second part of the process, which is how do you uh, mill that sugar and how do you transport that to then refine it, then I moved to, um, at that point I moved to New Orleans to understand the whole like plant operations. And from there I moved to London to join the, um, the finance, but also the uh, sales team. So understand like account management and sales. Then I moved back to New York. I joined, I started um, helping and supporting the M&A team on some of the deals they were um, they were looking at. It was a very slow pipeline, uh, very slow industry. Um, and I really wanted to move to a more dynamic industry, a more dynamic um, company, um, and also business in general, like a business that was growing, a business that was disrupting uh, industries. And I stumbled upon a great opportunity uh, at Freshly, which is a uh, ready prepared meal service. Um, I joined Freshly in 2019. And how I joined was I listened to a podcast and it was the CEO speaking. And I said, I need to work for him. So I messaged every single person on LinkedIn at Freshly uh, to get an interview. I got an interview and they made up a position for me. Uh, and I started with them. They were Series B at that time in 2019. They had raised 21 million, uh, led by Inside Venture Capital um, Partners, sorry, 
there were other large investors, uh, pretty big, significant investors like Highland Capital Partners, White Star Capital. And at that point, Freshly was operating at full capacity with 250,000 meals a week. And then uh, when I left in 2021, we had led um, the acquisition of Nestle for $1.5 billion. We were producing um, 1.7 million meals per week with five plants. So I was able to go through all of that growth, be part of the team that led that growth, but it was already a serious B startup when I joined. Um, and that's something that we can go into at some point, how to look into different startups and what to think about when joining a startup at a, at a very specific uh, stage where they're at. And then during the pandemic, while I was working at Freshly, I moved back to Colombia. I founded a nonprofit. Uh, we raised fund, funds from abroad and from Colombia to buy groceries and deliver these throughout Colombia. We were able to raise a quarter of a million dollars and benefit around 300,000 people. We were able to partner with the um, largest companies, uh, logistic companies and food companies in Colombia. We even partnered with the vice president of Colombia and the military. Uh, we appeared in most well-recognized TV networks, newspapers, radio magazines, and this happened in um, about six months. Six months, we were able to scale operations to have 100 people working uh, in the startup. So that was a, a crazy growth story there. Um, after that, in uh, last August of 2020, I, I came back to New York and I really wanted to start my own company. So I started like talking to other founders, uh, really going deep into some of the ideas that I had. Um, and I was pretty certain I could make this happen after being at a Series B startup, seeing all of that growth and starting my own thing, growing it uh, at a large scale. But then during this summer of 2021, I met Akash, which will be joining in like 15 minutes. Uh, he's the CEO of Glimpse, the current company I'm right now. It's a Y, it's a y Combinator. Uh, company uh, founded by the same investors as um, Airbnb, also um, some of the investors like angel investors are the founders of Eventbrite, Julia Hartz, and uh, I was really impressed by his ability to understand business trends and utilize tech to disrupt industries by creating new behavioral norms. And I met him during a program in New York called On Deck which was a program that brought together a hundred founders, startup operators like myself at that point, and um, venture capitalists to build an ecosystem of technology in New York City. And I met him through that, um, through that network. And I basically told him, I wanna work for you. <laughs> so the, the same, like uh, asking people for work is I think my story. <laughs> um, I, I joined Glimpse to lead the, um, the growth and strategy team. And we are uh, in seed uh, stage funding, uh, but going next year into hopefully raising a big Series A. Uh, but I'll let Akash go into more detail with that. Um, so that's a little bit of my story and how I started and where I'm at today. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna put in the chat, we have a list of rotational programs on our website and those can be really great ways to start a career. So I just wanna highlight that. Um, so you've been in growth and strategy. Can you share what does that really entail? What does a day look like? You know, we know the broad view of what that is, but can you give us more details on what a, what a career looks like in growth and strategy? Yeah, definitely. Can I share my screen? Here. So I'm going to be sharing this document that I put together. Sorry, it's not like the fanciest one. But basically, uh, I wanted to share this with you guys. Um, so a little bit about Glimpse. Um, and this is very much what strategy is, is really understanding what a startup is and what you're doing. And you always have to um, be thinking about the problem that you're solving, what your hypothesis is, and what you're building. And if you're not proving that hypothesis, maybe you have to pivot to a different solution 
if you truly believe on that hypothesis. So strategy is always having this in mind, right? And uh, for a glimpse, the problem that we're solving for is brands needing new channels to reach and acquire customers. Then our hypothesis is that by placing a product in a physical environment where someone can touch, feel that product and then go online, a brand will be able to reach and convert an audience more easily and less costly. And then our solution is that we're building a platform with, a, with marketplace and social network dynamics, enabling this hypothesis that we mentioned. Then that being said, like our supply in this case are the brand's products. Our product is the showroom property network that we offer. So showroom property network can be like Airbnbs, coffee shops, restaurants, hotels, like any retail uh, space that you can imagine of. And then the customer are those consumers purchasing these products. And then basically what, the, what direct to consumer is, which already exists today is a way to convert customers one-to-one. -one. And what we're building is a one-to-many-to-many -to -many commerce model. And I'll let Akash go into that detail. But basically what I do at Glimpse is always keep in mind that North Star KPI to hit. And you, like what I do is always focus on the strategy to prove product market fit. So um, when you're in a strategy and growth role, it really depends on what stage of the company you're in. Since we are pre-seed, for us to be able to raise a Series A, we need to prove product market fit, right? And what is product market fit? Is um, product market fit is using unbiased data to really understand if you built something that people really want and need. So that's product market fit. There's different ways of measuring this, but the question that you always have to ask is there data. Is there data to prove that you built something that people want and that people need? So in the stage where we are at today, my role right now is to focus on strategy to prove that product market fit while at the same time build the foundation for growth, right? So once we are able to prove product market fit, then we can uh, go raise a Series A and with that funding, pull, like, put the pedal on the gas for growth but there has to be a foundation for that growth, for that growth to be called blitzscaling, which is just growing at fast lightning speed. Um, and that's mostly like my focus today. That's really helpful. Thank you. I love the document. Um, question for you. So knowing what you know now, is there anything that you would have done differently while you were at Georgetown to set you up for this career path or just even just knowing what you know now? No, definitely. And I, and I, and I honestly kudos to you because I think that we didn't have this before, uh, these type of events. Uh, all of my friends were going into banking and consulting and I was pretty lost in terms of like, how could I get into the tech industry? So I, I think it's really, uh, it's really cool that you guys are doing this. Um, because there's a lot of opportunities out there um, in the tech industry and in the startup world and at different stages, both in the seed stage to the series A, B, C, even D, pre-IPO type of stage. So things that I didn't know before at Georgetown was how does a company raise money and why do they raise it? And the reason why I think that's important is because you're able to understand what is a company at different stages. And if you're interested in joining a company at those stages, right? Um, some of the things that I learned the hard way is how to network, how to look for these opportunities and where to look for them. And then like also understand what do I, uh, why do I like startups? And also why do I wanna do this long-term, right? Um, and I think those are questions that are hard to answer, but there's definitely resources out there that I'll share with you guys on how to do this. Well, you definitely mastered networking, that is for sure. <laughs> um, so given that you're saying that there's all these opportunities out there, how can students make themselves more attractive to tech startups or startups in general? Yeah, I think, so I have something here. Um, 
So suggestions on how to sell yourself or what do we look for at startups? So I think the most important um, thing to do is to ask yourself if you're an expert or a generalist or what Marissa Mayer, uh, which uh, was the VP of Google search products and user experience. Like, I'm also gonna go into this. I really think that one of the main um, tasks after this, if you're interested in startups, is look for people that you admire and study them. Uh, if you're able to study them, you'll be able to learn a lot about how they got into startups, what they're doing. It, it can even like open conversations with founders that you will reach out to. Um, but ba basically, my main suggestion is really understanding if you're an expert or if you're a generalist. And if you're an expert, uh, are, you a, are you a technical expert, right? And technical expert mostly is an engineer. Um, but if you're not, that's fine. Like you don't have to be an engineer to be at a startup. Um, you also need to have the spirit of we'll figure it out, we'll get it done. Like I got it, I'll do it, and wear different hats. Like that is really, really important. And most importantly, like you need to be able to act with less certainty. So what does this mean? Like there's not always a lot of data available for you to make decisions, and you need to be okay with that. Um, so I think these are these are important. And going deeper into Marisa Mayer, right? Like she was first VP of Google search products and user experience. And then she became um, head of local maps and location services, which I'm pretty sure we've all used. Um, and then she became CEO of Yahoo. Um, so definitely someone that knows about startups, right? And business in general. Um, so something that I'll be sharing with you guys is also this. Um, so this is, one second. So this is Marissa Mayer, and this is her thought on, um, on being an, an expert generalist. So um, being, being a, um, a generalist gives you the opportunity to get expertise in areas, right? That you would have never be, thought of being exposed to. Um, so it's similar to like a rotational program, but startups don't have rotational programs. But if you sell yourself as a generalist, like you'll be able to help with anything and then start developing that expertise that you can get, that, that then you can grow into that role. So that's the beauty of startups. Like you don't need to go into a startup by being a, an expert. You don't need to go into a startup by having like a very structured role, but you need to be okay with that. Like you need to be okay with your role being very general. And as, as time passes, like two months into a startup, like especially, especially if they're early stage, like that's a long time. And you're gonna learn a lot in two months that then you can start like moving your way into what you're most, mostly interested or even good at. So here, when she talks about being a, um, a generalist, the importance of this is when you're a journalist and work with different departments, you're able to form a network within the company and you will be able to see the connections between things. And this is a, this is a value that experts don't really have at companies. Um, and this is very powerful when it comes to startups. So I'll definitely, I'll definitely uh, send this out to you guys, which is a really cool episode of uh, Masters of Scale by Reid Huffman. Uh, and there's a great episode on her. So um, these are some of the suggestions that I have. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. That's perfect. Thank you for sharing that. This looks like a really interesting read. Um, is there anything else that you want to say before you turn it over to Akesh for a little bit? Yeah, um, yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, like I want to I want to encourage you to look for people that you admire and study them. So in my case, I really admire Reid Hoffman and Brian Chesky. Search for those people, right? Like look for the values that they believe in, the ways they think about, and then like start building your own values and what you want to do. Um, I don't want, I don't know what I want to do in life, but at least I know some of the values that um, I want to be pursuing. And for example, like I want to share these two. So Reid Hoffman, he started Social Net in 1997. 
uh, just when the dot com uh, boom was happening, uh, and he was already thinking about social networks. So this is someone that definitely thinks ahead of his time. Just Facebook was founded in 1994, seven years after he was already thinking about social networks. Uh, he worked with Peter Thiel and PayPal that then later went to IPO and shortly after was acquired by eBay for 1.5 billion. And then he founded LinkedIn, which was acquired by Microsoft for 26 billion. So definitely someone to look into. Um, and one of the values that I really share with him is his theory around human nature. So I wanna read you very quickly this, which is something that I really believe in and that I work towards. So he, Reed Hoffman says, what gives people most fabric and meaning and joy and presence in life is other people. So the theory of human nature is that we're social animals, that while they're introverts and extroverts, and while there are some people who really like being hermits, actually, in fact, the vast majority of the human race finds themselves getting meaning and joy and satisfaction, evolution on the people you're connected to. And this comes in many manners. Like This is not only LinkedIn. Like, LinkedIn is a clear example of this. But uh, even Airbnb, Facebook, like Instagram, every, every of the large social platforms that you use go in line with this value. And this is something that I really believe in and I want to learn every day from. Um, the other person that I really look um, uh, forward to being uh, similar or like learning from is Brian Chesky, founder and CEO of Airbnb, valued at 26 billion. Um, and basically what he values or his values are around like bringing the online world to the physical world and travel being a life transforming experience. So let's work on transforming people's lives, right? Like I really believe on working to transform other people's life. Uh, we did it at the nonprofit, but Brian does it in a different way. Um, and he always thinks, he thinks that he is able to transform people's life by uh, looking into designing six and seven star experiences. So basically what this means is going above and beyond others' expectations. And something very quickly that I want to share with you guys here is um, he, like his, um, his theory on um, building something viral and creating uh, an experience, a six-star experience, right? Um, so his example on um, Airbnb is um, going to like, a one, two, three experience is when you get to their Airbnb and no one's there, right? You knock on the door, they don't open. That's a one-star experience. Um, if they never show up and um, you don't get your money back, um, like these are experiences that are not five experiences, but a five-star a five -star experience is when you knock on the door, they open the door and they let you in, right? Which is not a big deal. It's like what you're expecting, but that was a five-star experience then how do I make a product that people love? How do I make a product that people love and share uh, with other people is by making it a six and a seven star experience. And then he goes on and on about like what a six star and seven star experience, then an eight star, then a nine star. And then like um, he gets to an 11 star experience. It would be if you show up at the airport, you're there, Elon Musk is waiting for you and says you're going to space. Right? Like he plays around with this, but basically what, what the idea is, you should always, when you're into strategy, product and growth, you should always be thinking about user experience and how to design a six or seven star experience. Um, so yeah, some of this are like the people that I really um, study and look into. Um, and then myself and my values, like, at Glimpse, we're bridging the gap between the online and the physical world when it comes to brand discovery, sales, and marketing. We're basically playing for the little guys. If you think about it, when you place a product in a property for free, that person or that host and that property is allowing, uh, well, we're allowing these properties to provide more value to the guests and the people that go through these properties. That's basically what hotels uh, have access to. That's basically what influencers have access to. Like they are given wholesale prices or even like free products, but then we're doing this for every host in the short-term rental space today. Uh, so we're basically transforming people's lives. 
Um, and I'm always thinking also on how can technology be used to make other people's lives better and then having like win-win-win values. I believe that here where brands, hosts, and guests are winning in this equation and then eventually glimpse. And then in my head, like the values that I share and that I want to um, implement in this company is that if every stakeholder in your equation is winning, you will eventually succeed with them, not the other way around. So I think this is like these are all important uh, things for you guys to to consider. That uh, just to close and then to go into uh, a cash, um, I just wanna share with you like a definition from another person that I study and look into, who's Gustav Asramer. He was a product and growth lead at Airbnb. He was number two in the product and growth team. Um, so he's, he talks about like, if you're thinking about startups, like you should be thinking about growth. And if you build something that has potential of being really, really big, then growing it is what a startup is all about. Uh, the people are busy, the world is busy. So just by putting something into the market, like it won't grow. You got to work towards that. So that's a closing statement that I wanted to make. And then I want to hand it off to Akash. Um, as I mentioned, Akash and I met during the summer of 2021. I was really impressed uh, by what he was building, the team he had. I met his founders, uh, his co-founders during uh, the program that I was, I was also, um, that we were in together, uh, which is called On Deck. And then, yeah, I wanna leave, leave it off to Akash. So Akash, like welcome, uh, welcome to the Georgetown community. Uh, thanks for taking the time to to speak with this great group of people and students that are interested in, in in startups. And if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself, like uh, the different experiences that you've had in your career. Um, Akash uh, graduated and um, well, became a founder straight out of college, but he has several experiences before that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you became a founder, and then we'll go into more questions. Yeah, awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been super cool. Um, I think Andres is really great. So being able to just learn a little bit about how he thinks, I think is very useful. Um, kind of, I actually, fun fact, grew up in Northern Virginia, so very close to Georgetown. Um, but I went to Purdue all the way in the Midwest in the middle of nowhere. But <laughs> I grew up spending a lot of time on Georgetown's campus and stuff, which is cool, but a little bit about me. Yeah, so I graduated in uh, May, 2020, uh, like, right. I didn't actually have a graduation. Um, it was a virtual graduation, but um, nonetheless, it was very cool. So I studied, um, I was in the business school at Purdue in industrial management and in the um, engineering school um, for computer engineering. But um, I think for me, what really was interesting about entrepreneurship actually wasn't even like the concept of startups in the first place, but it was just like um, creating communities and things like that. So when I first got to Purdue, like Purdue's a very engineering heavy school. So I th um, one of the things that I got involved with immediately was building our entrepreneurial community. So I started like an entrepreneurship club um, and we had like a student co-working space type of experience that I helped um, coordinate and like bring entrepreneurs and founders back. And that was actually my first like startup experience. I felt like I was creating something um, bringing people together, working with the university um, to like help run competitions. And just basically like, there's a lot of great Purdue alumni um, across the world that have done amazing things in entrepreneurship that just didn't really have like an engagement with um, our campus. So that was like my first foray. And I think like my junior, I started doing these like startup weekend competitions. Um, so like, I remember my freshman year, I had this idea called Freebie, just like free stuff on campus and app to find those things. My second year, I did one where it's like waste analytics in restaurants. So like, there's all these softwares that you can use to like book things like, um, like you know, like open table or whatever. Could you build something like that in the back end of a restaurant where like whenever there's leftover food, it donates it to food banks and like whatever it may be. And it was cool. It was like, I, I walked around all around Lafayette, Indiana, talking to restaurant owners and things like that. Um, and then I, my junior year, I had an idea where um, like, Basically, if you think about like, yeah, like some place like Purdue, like in the middle of nowhere, there's a lot of stores that just don't exist. Like 
I think in Georgetown, there's a lot of cool stores that you can walk around on campus, like near campus, but like Purdue has like a similar demographic of people, but no brands kind of engaging. And I, I just basically, um, we were like, could we use the, um, like, instead of ordering things online, could we return them somewhere else, et cetera? And that, like, that junior year was essentially like my journey into entrepreneurship. I just kept working on ideas kind of like afterwards. But I think like the main thing that was really important in college for me was really just growing out of my shell to kind of like just create and like have a bias towards action. Like um, I came in a little bit late, but Andres was talking about like meeting the right people, like whatever it may be. I think being surrounded by like um, people who um, were just like thinking about ideas and things was really cool because like if you know like the software engineering community, like hackathons are a really big concept. It's a great way to get internships, whatever it may be. But if you think about like the business community, there's not as many of those things. There may be like case competitions for consulting roles or, you know, like also yeah, case competitions for like banking roles, whatever it may be. But there isn't really one that kind of intersects um, like startups and like technology with this type of talent really until you're like a few years in your career. Like, and I think for me, like, yeah, like building things is fun, but also like the business side of it was what really excited me. And I did case, you know, like case competitions, like I was doing all the consulting interviews, case interviews for whatever, but I always had the most fun kind of like in these like startup competitions, like hosting events or whatever it may be. So that's how I kind of found my passion. And yeah, like my junior year, we essentially pivoted that like fitness, uh, sorry, returns idea into like a pop-up shop business. Like imagine, like we basically, like my co-founders, uh, and I, we basically like rented a U-Haul truck and put like stuff in it and parked it in the middle of campus and like people were buying things. And then like fast forward, that became glimpse like uh, seven or eight months later. And then, um, uh, yeah, like uh, Andres mentioned one of the people he really looks up to boost stuff. Like he actually was um, through a program called Y Combinator. They're like a Silicon Valley uh, incubator. That was, they were like the first investors in like Airbnb and like Instacart and companies like that. Gustav is actually a partner there and he really liked our idea about Glimpse and like gave us funding uh, when we were still in school actually. And then yeah, upon graduation, this has been my only full-time job. Um, in college, I interned at companies like Microsoft and Tesla, but those were just kind of like big tech companies. Definitely like great experiences, but it taught me a lot. Like Tesla is a very cutthroat, like do what it takes type of culture. Like I um, had like a salary. So like, I remember, I think I was paid over time, like, over 75% of my internship, like that's how many hours we're kind of put in. And I realized like, oh, I'm working so hard. Um, shouldn't I be putting this effort into like my own type of thing? And then I worked at Microsoft, which like, if you've heard, you know, like tech culture is a little bit more chill. Like there's like good benefits and things. Like there's like, I had intern events like every day, whatever it may be. And then I was just like, this is really fun, but do I want to be like creating my own type of thing? So that was a little bit of like a journey I took you on, but all in all, I think, um, yeah, like my time in college was very critical to where I am today. And I think like um, that sort of like just bias towards action was like probably the main catalyst for just like anything. Even when we look for talent now and when we're hiring, like we like one of the first employees we hired was also like a new grad out of school. Um, she um, didn't necessarily have like tech internships or whatever, but like in college, she had done like a like a project where she like helped Airbnbs and uh, like get like um thing like they're housing nurses and like sending them welcome packages and like that in itself on a resume like those projects are what I care about like obviously like backgrounds and pedigree don't matter to me as much being a 23 year old so it's more very much like the that like things that you do like that bias towards action is like what I look for when I'm recruiting Thank you. It was really great to hear your story and the difference, you know, between working at a larger company and founding your own. And I really appreciated hearing this bias towards action as something that you're looking for. Um, any questions from, from the audience? I have a question. Um, how, was, how was Y Combinator? Did you like it? Can you tell me a little bit about how that was, especially going out of college? Yeah, so um, yeah, it was definitely like, like a life-changing type of experience. I think that um, it really fast forwards like reality. Like I was living at home uh, during like the pandemic had just kind of started in March and um, we were just kind of like working on this company. Like, but then like my co-founders had to like move in with me because like we just had to be like in the same room. Um, and I think like what is really interesting and like if you're interested in entrepreneurship or like 
working at startups, like they've democratized a lot of their information that like 10 or 15 years ago would have been like hidden, you know, like how to build a startup or like, you know, like things like growth is very important or like get your users to love you. Like you can search up like Y Combinator videos and that's all already like published. They have like a startup school. They even have a job portal. Like for example, like if Glimpse is ever interesting for a job, like Glimpse jobs are primarily posted on work at a startup.com. Like it's a very nice domain name. I'll actually just put that right here. I think it's a really good job board. Um, it's just Y Combinator companies that post jobs. Um, but yeah, but basically like, but when you go in, like you basically have to set like a metric. So for example, like revenue is very important for startups and you're just kind of like trying to grow that like every single week. Um, and I think that's where like, you know, like what Andres mentioned about like a generalist, like doing whatever it takes, like me as a founder or like even as an employee, like my background is like product management or software engineering, but at a startup, you're doing customer support. You're doing, um, you're doing like, I don't know, like operations, you're doing sales, you're doing, you might even need to like build some software tools yourself. Like you have to kind of learn and kind of get it done. And like, that's what that period was. Um, I think the main catalyst is raising venture capital. Um, when you're like at a startup, I think um, what's really important is like, if you choose to be a startup where you raise money from investors, specifically like startup investors, the clear goal that everyone has signed upon is that you're like going to take this company public or be like a multi-billion dollar business. There's a lot of, you know, like a lot of worlds where you can join a business that is like a stable, you know, like revenue generating business, but to be part of like an early stage technology startup, you basically, it's like, okay, five years, like we're going to be on like the New York stock exchange. And that's what investors are believing in. And for me, like asking people for money is something I've never done. And then raising like millions of dollars is something that like, you don't really know how to do. Um, there's no way, no way to learn that really, but why Combinator has done that like thousands of times where that's probably their main like experience. So for me, it went from like college kid to like multi-million dollars in our bank. And like, and for me, like not knowing how to do that to like learning how to like pitch an investor, et cetera. I think that's what they really trade me on. Thank you guys. I have a question for Andres. Um, how did you find your community that is also as interested in tech and startups since most Georgetown kids gravitate towards banking and consulting. More specifically, what activities were you involved in and what would you recommend for Georgetown undergrads? Um, I, was, I, I was going into, into startups later in my career, not straight out of school, um, which is why I think that what you are doing here is great because there was not a big tech community or I didn't really know about it, right? There was a startup uh, community, I remember that. There's actually a founder, a friend of mine, Claudia Recchi, uh, she's a founder, and she started uh, her company straight out of college. She actually raised, like last month, a Series A. So it would be great for, to have her here speak to you guys. Um, but I found the startup community, honestly, by networking. It was mostly like that. Um, looking into TechCrunch, which companies are being uh, are raising capital, reaching out to founders directly through LinkedIn, uh, looking for calls, um, listening to podcasts, and um, going to my network. But my network was not a founder network, so it was kind of uh, hard to to utilize this. But once you start like pushing your way through, uh, you get you you're, you're able to to utilize the network that you get into. So, for example, for me, um, it was hard because I believe today it's being like that's that's changing a bit, but it's mostly about the founders and the investors, and not really about the people that want to get into the startup or that type of business. Uh, so pushing my way into it was mostly about cold calling people, um, but having something to talk about. So that's why I think it's important that you educate yourself as well. If I uh, could quickly chime in, um, one thing I would also say, or like there's a lot of virtual communities accelerated by the pandemic, like maybe not tied to the university. So this is one that I found um, really early. Let me just try to link it. Um, they actually have a job board of non-technical roles at startups, including internships posted uh, every single week. 
And this is something that I was actually applying to, you know, like my junior year, like subscribing to their newsletter. It's like purely focused on um, startups. So that's one I would recommend. And then I would also say, um, um, like Purdue had a similar culture where there weren't, there was not, not really any startup clubs or anything. So I would say like um, one, like maybe like do trading things. Like if you can, you know, like work with the professor, or like whatever it may be and like start a small community, like do fireside chats, whatever, like the community will slowly grow. Um, and separately, like being in DC, there is like a DC startup hub as well that have like external events. I remember like when I was, uh, whenever I'm back in town, there's like a few successful startups in the DC area called like, like Framebridge or whatever. And there's communities and in, in, uh, like co-working spaces as well that could be great to like, tap into. And these are most of the times free and people don't know that. So um, definitely use, use those opportunities. I also added some information in the chat, um, but for those who will be seeing this recording later, um, there is a student group, Disruptive Tech, and so they're very interested in bringing tech students together and they plan events. They focus a lot on non-tech roles in tech um, specifically. There's also the Entrepreneurship Initiative, um, which isn't always tech, but can be tech. And they have an internship program and you could just sign up for their newsletter to start. You don't have to minor um, in entrepreneurship. We also have a flight tech internship program and that is in partnership with the Georgetown Tech Alliance. Um, and then uh, recently, uh, Hoya started up a Slack group called Startup Hoya's Slack. Um, so you could also get involved with that. So there are definitely opportunities uh, at Georgetown. I know sometimes it feels like it's consulting and finance, but we are trying to do more to support tech interested students. Any oh, and definitely, definitely, I wanted to mention that we didn't have that back in 2017. So. It's amazing that you that you've gone um, so far in just a couple of years. So um, just really like kudos to you. And if there was something, at least I didn't know about it, and that also says something about the whole situation. But uh, I think you guys gone a really long way, and it's amazing to see that that happen. Um, one more thing that I wanted to 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 go over uh, before like opening this um, to more of a Q and A. Um, I mentioned that when I when I went back uh, from Colombia after the nonprofit, I was ready to start my own company, but it was really um, Akash, the interaction with Akash, that led me to to believe in his vision believing his team and really believe in what he wanted to build. So I want Akash also to tell us what are you building and what are you trying to build? Oh, putting me on the spot here, but um, yeah, I mean, Andre stuff we touched upon like glimpse and like the values, but essentially I think if you think about it, yeah, like there's essentially three stakeholders that were really, you know, like apply, like working for here. There's like the brand retailers. So if you think about like the products you see like Instagram hats for like every single day, um, there's these like physical spaces like Airbnbs, like hotels, gyms, et cetera. And then like us, like as consumers, like if you look just around you, there's a lot of products that are just kind of there that like maybe like plants, um, or like chairs, whatever it may be. And we have this vision where, you know, like in five or 10 years where like anything around you can essentially be like shoppable, um, you know, like touch of a QR code or whatever it may be. Because as this world, you know, like moves much more online, I think some of those trends have been accelerated by things like COVID, whatever it may be. Um, we still live like in the real world and um, being able to like keep those experiences alive, I think is like what we really envision. And we're doing it in a way that really provides like, you know, like a revenue stream and like an income stream for a group of like solo entrepreneurs, like these short-term rental hosts, they're business owners in and of themselves. Uh, especially when we started this business, um, we first started we're talking to Airbnb hosts right before you know, like COVID shut down a lot of their businesses. And the first thing that we did was connect them to nurses, um, you know, like, or whatever it may be for housing. So we have this like in our DNA where 
we can provide additional revenue for them, help them grow their businesses in a way that delights consumers and changes like a consumer behavior in a way that provides more revenue for the brands that, you know, like are growing like um, and products that we use like every day. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, we really want to change like, you know, like you think of the world in a certain way right now, like there's malls and there's like online stores. We really want to build like a new generation of like commerce and how we essentially can yeah, like just like thinking about like like we're all like like in five years, like the world will be very different. Can we be a part shaping that?